Shakespeare was so brilliant in so many different ways, even in the vastu of how he wrote the verse. So when Brutus is speaking, I'm talking about the play Julius Caesar. When Brutus is speaking, the text is very blocky. It, if you look at it on the page, it looks like a square. And Brutus is this very kind of solid square kind of a guy, right? And he makes his argument for why Caesar shouldn't be Caesar. And it's all very logical, makes perfect sense. Okay. And then Caesar comes on and it's all wavy. The writing is wavy. It's not stable, but it, it invokes the power and the emotion of the public, of the people listening. And of course, who wins the argument? It's not Brutus. Logic does not prevail. So just even that is part of uh, Shakespeare's brilliance. Now, um, I'm going to share my screen here and show you. How many words do you think were invented by Shakespeare? If you know, if you know that don't don't chime in, but if you don't know, just take a guess. Could you repeat the question one more time? Sorry. Uh, yes, the question was how many words that Shakespeare invent that we are using today as part of our everyday language? Guess a bit, 588. That's pretty damn good, actually. It's technically it's more, but it's between, depending on who you ask, between 700 and 1500. And, and see here it's 422, but um, words like eyeball, words like, um, here, let's, let's list some of the common words we use every day. Um, safe space way back. No, these are, no, these aren't common words. Accessible, accommodation, addiction, admirable. Are these all really his words? Yeah. These are bona fide, minted, coined, and invented by Shakespeare. Okay, these are 422 Whoever Shakespeare was, probably was not who they think he is. <laughs> yeah, the word accessible, he invented it. Ad addiction, admirable, aerial, airless, amazement, anchovy. Room, belonging, birthplace. Yeah. Bedroom. Sorry, accidentally unmuted. <laughs> Sorry. No, that's fine. It's amazement, arch, arch villain. These are words we use. Yeah, we, we certainly know them. Bloodstained, blood sucking, brisky, bump. The word bump. Cat like, candle holder, cheap, characterless, chimney top, circumstantial, church like, cold hearted, compact, control. The word control. He invented the word control. Is that possible? What did no. they use? And dawn either. I mean, dawn and dusk have already existed, no? I guess not. Incredible. Tell me. Dawn? Did he invent the word dawn? He... Okay, let's go back and check the source here. Compiling a definitive list is impossible. Yeah, and some lists go up to 1500. That's what I'm saying. But creating a list of the words that Shakespeare almost certainly invented can be done. This is he was the first to use in written language and then applying research that has identified which words were probably in everyday use during Shakespeare time. The result are 422 bona fide, minted, coined, and invented by him. Not, they were not in use before him. So it gets to me that like in country music, people go, um, Hank Williams is the Shakespeare of country music. Don't get me wrong. I like Hank Williams. He wrote some amazing songs. But to say he's the Shakespeare, 
Come on. It's how many words did he invent? How many, you know, how has he inspired history? In like, do we in our everyday lives refer, use phrases and, and, and uh, allusions that he made? So these are just words, but also concepts that he invented. No, we don't. And when I hear people, oh, he's the Shakespeare of so-and-so. First of all, you're doing a disservice to the person you're comparing because they're not the Shakespeare of anything. And anyway, it just kind of gets to me. Cruel. Anyway, so more words, more words. East Indies, embrace. I guess he invented the word embrace. Downstairs, domineering, dwindle, epileptic, equivocal, eventful. Excitement and amazement. <laughs> so I would say Shakespeare is the Vyasa of the English language. Now, Vyasa was similar many thousands of years ago before Shakespeare, who wrote the Mahabharata. Now, there is a, you could say, in terms of literature, a, you could make an argument there is a comparison. Hint, let me give you a hint. How many times do you use that? A gust of wind, green-eyed, gray-eyed, grime, hostile. What was the English language before this? Like if you went back to say 1200 or 1300 or 1400 and you use these words, you wouldn't be understood. <laughs> I think there are some blue-eyed hostiles approaching us. People go, parlez-vous anglais? <laughs> They'll think you're French or something. Jaded, juiced, invulnerable, invitation, investment, informal, lackluster, lament. Man, if I invent one word like this, I would be, you know, pretty lonely. Simon, you've invented so many words. Come Have on. I? Which <laughs> ones? Wait. I don't remember. But, you know. I mean, which ones have I? Well, maybe I have, maybe. Okay. But you know what? They're probably not listed anywhere. I invent them all the time. Fabuloso. Fabuloso. Fantastico. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and that's true. And some of the, uh, some, probably a lot of them are like Ludster or to leapfrog. There, there were words that existed and he just put them together. Right. So that's okay. That's allowed. Lone existed, and he just created the word lonely. The gringo Sanskrit, yeah, I guess I invented that, yeah. Just put two words together. Manage and an er, a person who manages becomes a manager. He invented it. So what were managers called before then? Majestic from majesty. Who invented bullshit, for example? <laughs> Probably Hank Williams Jr., because he's the Shakespeare of country music. No, it's going to sound like I'm, I'm going off. I like Hank Williams. Uh, bullshit. Yeah, it's a perfect word. Well, let's see. Did he invent it? <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised. It would be under the bees. No. I'm it's... sure that was a literal invention, meaning someone stepped into something and said it. And ah, everybody well, like it. Yeah. And then, <laughs> and then it just caught on. Uh, let's see. Garden hose. Garden hose. Oh, garden house, sorry. Gallantry, full grown, freezing. He invented the word freezing. So aside from having invented a minimum of four, four to 500 words used every day in everyday life, in everyday ink, not crazy words like thou or, or, you know, or, or which he also used, kicky wicky, that's a good one. Okay, I'll grant you that one. Inauspicious. Inauspicious, right? A word we astrologers use every day. And probably the word auspicious was already in use, so he just added a prefix, guys. You know? So it's not... Some of these aren't major works of genius, but how did he know about anabolic steroids? Let me ask you that. He did invent the word juiced, so he was a prophet. Um, but some of them are very lustrous, 
madcap militarist moonbeam. That's pretty inventive. I guess sunbeam already existed. He invented moonbeam. Obscene. The word ode? He invented the word ode? Wow. That's, we're only halfway there. So my point is, he was not only brilliant in inventing words, but even the vastu of how he wrote matched the character of the person. Those of you who are just kind of joining, I was talking about, because I started the class with humans, friends, humans, countrymen, uh, which is from Julius Caesar. And when Brutus spoke, I'll just repeat this for the sake of the recording, that um, his writing, his, his words on the page were very blocky, very logical, his arguments for why Julius Caesar shouldn't be. And then Caesar comes, I think it's Caesar, or is it Mark Antony? I, I forget, it's been a long time. And his, you know, his verse is all kind of like this. It's, it's uh, you know, epileptic, if you will. It's, it's uh, that's not a good adjective. See, I'm, I can't invent words. Let me pick one from here. It's raw boned. It's raw, <laughs> it's raw boned. Meaning it, it's creative. It's, it's not, it appeals to the emotions, not to logic. And of course, the people choose his argument, not Brutus's. So um, Shakespeare understood Vastu in a, at least in an intuitive way. He understood, obviously, linguistics. He understood politics. Oh, look at these are verbs now. To barber, to belly, to besmirch, to bet. Thank you. To castigate, to champion, to comply, to educate, to elbow. Wow, to gossip. To happy, I don't know. How do you happy someone? To hinge, to humor, to negotiate. Amazing. It's amazing to me. Now, whether he was the, the country person that they think he was or he was somebody else, that's a whole different argument. But whoever this person was, wow. To unsex. Tortive, traditional, tranquil, transcendence. Unreal, all of these un, unpolluted, unmusical, unmitigated, unquestioned, unswayed. Anyway, um, I am a fan of excellence, people who do things incredibly well. And he is one of the excellent ones in the, for the English language. So um, let's get to our topic. How is everybody? I think we're all here. Everyone doing okay? Just out your yard sale and using lucky times to predict when people are coming. Oh, yeah? Is it working? Yeah, people come through when it pops up, but it doesn't necessarily hit. Oh, man. <laughs> well, <laughs> the, they can only take you so far. Um, if it's a lucky day, you know, sometimes the lucky day or if it's a lucky week. Yeah. yeah. But uh, so they tend to pop in when the lucky times are in play. Yeah. That's interesting. I never thought of testing it that way. But they don't, they're don't. they not necessarily buying. I bet you when there's a money yoga, they'll be buying. Now, if you don't know what Zach's referring to, mm -hmm. uh, luckytimesapp.com is you can find your lucky times. Just put in your birth information and your where you're located. Your current location and your birth time and place. And you'll get a printout. And, um, and we'd love your feedback. So Zach, since you're testing it, if you can say like when you actually get people and you make a sale, you can say, oh, it was during technique E1 and just tell us, hey, there was a big win, a small win, you broke even or you lost, you know? And we really, really appreciate that because it helps us make the program better. Lucky time's up. Um, Okay, so let's, let's get into some announcements and some cool things uh, looking forward. First of all, our book club, for our book club, we are going to be looking at the book called Seven Systems of Indian Philosophy. Um, this is something that uh, 
I think is missing in, in, in traditional Jyotisha study in that we jump into the practice without knowing the, um, the foundation of, of what the practice is. Like people start doing a lot of yoga asana before really understanding yoga shastra. And in the shastra itself, it says the asana practice and the philosophy have to go hand in hand. They have to be equal. So um, we're going to be doing this with our book club this month. So I hope you guys can join us. And um, Mr. Tigunite has written an amazingly concise and well explained book. And I'm just going to read you page one. Okay. And just how much deep, beautiful info you can get just from page one. It's probably just page one or two. So just bear with me. I'm going to read this to you. And if this is interesting to you, we can, we'll discuss the rest of it in our club. The Sanskrit word for philosophy is darshana, which means direct vision. This word highlights a major difference between Western philosophy, which relies on intellectual, intellectual pursuit, and Indian philosophy, which relies on direct vision of truth and pure buddhi, pure reasoning. With the exception of a few Christian and Jewish, Jewish mystics, not many modern Western philosophers would agree with Plato's definition of a philosopher as one who loves the vision of truth. But it is precisely this vision of truth that informs the foundation of all but the most materialistic schools of Indian philosophy. So the word philosophy is darshana in Sanskrit. Of course, philosophy means a love of knowledge itself, philo, right? Philosophy. Or a love of truth? Yeah, a love of truth. A second difference between Western and Indian philosophies is that the latter are more comprehensive. Western philosophies and sciences tend to comp compartmentalize. Um, I'm just going to skip a little. But the major Indian schools integrate into a single framework metaphysics, epistemology, logic, axiology. I don't even know what axiology is. Someone can explain it to me. Aesthetics, ethics, sociology, psychology, and physiology. Meaning Ayurveda, Vata, Pitta, Kapha. Psychology, Sattva, Rajas, Tamas. Sociology, Dharma, Shastra. Ethics, Manusmriti. Aesthetics, you can say the 64 Kalas in, in, in the practices of, of refinement. Logic. Uh, you can say Nyaya Shastra, um, epistemology, metaphysics, which is all the... Anyway, so all of these speak, speak the same language and they are part of the darshanas. To Indian thinkers, these disciplines are so interrelated that they are looked upon as if residing in a single body whose members cannot be severed from the whole without losing their vitality. Axiology. So Saskia is saying, uh, if I remember correctly, axiology is the study of things that are worth something valuable. Okay. That's good. Thank you. Um, so like Artha Shastra, that would be Indian philosophy. Um, philosophy is not divorced from practical life. Theoretical knowledge that has no application in daily life is not philosophy at all. Tell that to the philosophy majors. <laughs> but is mere metaphysical speculation. The conclusions and beliefs that grow out of Indian philosophy form the foundation of all the other sciences and arts, including the natural sciences, medicine, political science, law, literature, sculpture, dance, etc. Um, Indian philosophy addresses the natural and spiritual needs of man from knowledge of supreme consciousness to the science of medicine in Ayurveda. Now, that's just Interesting, right? Let's go on. The term Indian is also subject to further clarification. What does Indian mean? Where did it come from? It is used here to describe those philosophical schools that originated, developed, and flourished in the area that today comprises the whole of Southeast Asia. The word Indian should not, however, be used interchangeably with the term Hindu, with which it is closely related etymologically. He's going to talk about what, what that means. 
The term Hindu is not only a misnomer, it's misleading because it carries the connotation of a religion. Indian and Hindu have never been used in India itself to refer to nationality, culture, religion, or philosophy. Well, they are now, I mean, but at least some years ago, they weren't. Indians actually called their subcontinent Bharata after the ancient king Bharata, whose name means one who is capable of nourishing and protecting. The root is Bhr or Bri, which means to, to carry or to, to hold up. Um, king Bharata was capable of nourishing and preserving the golden bird of India when it was flourishing, the flourishing international center of wealth and culture. Bharata also means lover of knowledge, or in this case, the land that loves knowledge. Furthermore, the current popular usage of the term Hinduism does not correspond to its meaning. When Alexander the Great invaded uh, around 325 BC, he crossed the river Sindhu and renamed it Indus, okay? which was easier for the Greek tongue to pronounce. Alexander's Macedonian forces subsequently called the land to the east of this river, India. So the name India is a, comes from the Greeks, or the uh, not Greeks, Macedonians. Later, the Muslim invaders called the Sindhu River the Hindu River, because in their language, Parsi, the Sanskrit sound S converts to H, S converts to H. Thus, for the pa Persians, Sindhu became Hindu. And the land east of that river became knows, known as Hindustan. Stan means land or place. In more recent times, the land was again called India, but during the British regime, politicians frequently used the terms Hindu and Hinduism, emphasizing the religious and political overtones of these words. This was done to differentiate the Hindus from the Muslims, thus aiding the British policy of divide and rule. Western writers then adopted these terms for the sake of convenience, and Eastern writers conformed to the norms set by those in power. So we still use those norms, by the way. And look, it's okay. Use those norms. That's fine. But know where it came from, where the word India comes from, what the word Hindu really means. Because it has nothing to do with religion, right? Although if you say I'm a Hindu, even people who live in India, whether it's in South, North, East, West, they'll say I'm Hindu because of the you know, the use, but this is a term that's not, it's not a Sanskrit term. It's not a, it's, it's a term that's been imposed on this culture by outside regime regime, starting with Alexander, then with the Persians, then with the Muslims, and then with the British. So, um, Confusion spread as the word Hinduism increasingly became came to be used to designate the region, the religion of the Indian people. In actuality, it's more properly used to describe the entire culture of a geographic region that, though apparently quite diverse, holds many underlying characteristics in common. The misconceptions surrounding the term Hinduism now make it a virtually useless word. Its usage is roughly analogous to the hypothetical case of invaders occupying the United States and referring to the native way of life as Yankeeism and then purporting this to be the American religion. <laughs> In India, no religion called Hinduism ever existed. I'll read that again. In India, no religion called Hinduism ever existed. And even today, the learned and well-informed spiritual and religious leaders do not use this term. They use instead Sanatana Dharma, which means the eternal law to refer to their systems of religious belief. Okay, look, if you wanna use the term, that's fine. I don't have an issue with that, but a lot of us don't know what we're saying when we say that term and, and what it brings up. So if you like this, then you'll like our book club this month, November, where we're going to cover, we're actually going to uh, divide, slice up this book into sections because look in just these two pages you can kind of drop the mic here and go okay i need to review <laughs> i need to review everything okay philosophy is darshana india is not india it comes from the word sindhu 
which then became no Indus, Sindhu, which became Indus. And so then India is the land east of the Indus. Okay. And what was the other part? Oh, Hinduism, right? It's, but see how Tigunite has the, the perspicacity and, and the gift of, of really giving it to you as a little tidbit in, uh, and, and making it, I think, very uh, digestible. So that's what we're doing. Yes, so get your copy of this book. And um, yes, uh, if you own this book already, now you can dust it off the shelf. So when I went to the Ayurvedic Institute, why am I excited? When we studied Ayurveda, the first semester of study was not just Vata Pitta Kapha. In fact, Zach, what did we start with even before Vata Pitta Kapha? Before what is Ayurveda? What was the first things we studied? It was Shaddarshana. We studied the six systems of philosophy. Now, why, are, why does this book say seven? Because Buddhism is added to it, which is not part of the traditional Shad six darshanas. So before we ever launched, you ever launched into the subject matter, you, you started with the philosophy, which, okay, I'll be honest with you, it was kind of boring to me when I went to school. But now it's kind of interesting again, because it really does help you round out your, your understanding. Plus, you can sound really, really snarky at parties. Oh, what's, uh, do you do Hindu astrology? Well, technically, Hindu is a bit of a nationalistic term, and it's not technically accurate. What I do is Jyotisha, which is the study of light, you see? And, and it's great if you upspeak, like, um, it's the study of light, and it's Jyotisha, right? Because then you sound like a real jerk. Uh, <laughs> when you're telling people, I believe in just speaking directly. This is what I do. This is what it is. And if they ask me, then I'll tell them, yeah, that's what this means. And that means anyway, um, it's, it can be dangerous to disabuse people of their ignorance all at once. I know this because when people disabuse me, disabuse means to remove or doesn't mean to abuse. Um, when people have disabused me of my ignorance, I get defensive sometimes too. I've been, what do you mean? I'm not right, right? So you want to be gentle with it and, and only if they're ready and ask for it. So, okay, so that's the first announcement. Um, second announcement is, uh, and I'm, I'm giving you guys all this because this is our last class. Um, and I thought, yes, last time was our last, but this is officially our last class. Um, I'm giving you all this to give you a, a vision of what, what to look forward to. So we are starting a Vedic astrology school. And from soup to nuts, it's going to take you from complete beginner all the way to a certified Vedic astrologer by ACFA. And, um, and people who are in between, who've already taken a bunch of classes, you can get credit for those classes from me. You'll have to test out. You can test out of them. But this school, unlike any other Jyotisha school, is going to include, we're going to watch the Mahabharata together. We're going to do some Sanskrit. Not in a pedantic way, not in a, oh, if you don't know Sanskrit grammar, you can't pass. Not like that. In a fun way, right? I, I mean, you know how I do things. So hopefully if this is fun, then that'll be fun for you too. We're going to do a little bit of philosophy. We're going to add, we're going to add some flavor, right? It, it's, if, you, if people who study Jyotisha are like people on a diet, like all they do is eat, you know, crackers and protein shake. And that's it. Crackers, protein shake, crackers, protein shake. We're going to add some, a little bit of spice, some masala, some ice cream at the end, right? You might get a little fat. It's okay, but you'll be happy. Okay. So we're looking to launch this next year. 
Uh, yes, ice cream for Pam Rose, ice cream for me too. Look at my face. Do you think I like ice cream? Of course. I used to eat a whole half gallon of briars. This is way back when. And then I take a giant tablespoon of trifola and wash it down. And whoosh, that used to work. It doesn't work anymore. And I don't recommend it. But Don't do this at home, people. <laughs> don't try this at home. <laughs> I've tried a lot of things. Um, yeah, no banana splits. That's very Ayurvedically wrong, banana split. Mm. Um, so this is the vision a complete Jyotisha Academy that will also certify you to practice at the end. And of course, the cherry on top, the, or you could really say the transmission, the driving part of this, driving part is the engine, the transmission, the thing that makes you, makes it shift it into high gear, is uh, you're going to actually earn and get paid to go to take my classes, to take, go to this school. So not only do you pay, you will pay tuition, but you're going to earn part of that tuition back when you graduate.